Before we go into detail again, can we just step back and look at the environment and the culture that we're in, um, where you know, there are many popular theories, and in one sense Darwin um, got his traction by disseminating his Origin of Species book and the like. It, right. It's quite difficult in the present context to come through with any new theory and somehow penetrate the, the, the culture. Well, one of the things that uh, makes intelligent design get immediate traction is that it is, in a sense, uh, the alternative, the natural alternative to the main thrust of the Darwinian argument. Uh, Charles Darwin, it's a brilliant book, beautifully argued, and one of the things that he was trying to show was that the appearance of design that all biologists recognized at the time and that biologists today recognize was the product of an undirected, unguided mechanism, which he called natural selection. And he anal analogized natural selection to the powers that human breeders are, were known to have in changing the attributes of a population. I always like to use the example of sheep in the far north of Scotland. And uh, breeders or ranchers of sheep, sheep herders, would, uh, if they wanted to breed a woollier breed of sheep, they would select the wooliest males and the wooliest females out of the population and allow only them to breed. The next generation would be a, a, a tiny bit woollier, and then they'd make the same selection process again, pulling the very wooliest out, allowing only them to breed, repeating through several cycles, and eventually they'd get a woolier breed of sheep. Darwin came along, he didn't use the sheep as an example, that's my example, but with other organisms, and he said, he said, well, couldn't we have a series of natural changes in environment that would produce the same outcome? So for example, using my example, couldn't we have a series of very cold winters that would kill off all but the wooliest males and females so that only they would breed and so that in the end, the outcome would be the same, a woolier breed of sheep. And, and that was his, kind of his brilliant insight, that nature could do what the human breeder could do. Therefore, nature could select what we heretofore thought only intelligence could do. And so his mechanism of natural selection was thought to be, was, was presented as a, a kind of designer substitute that could explain the principal evidence of design that had captured the imagination of 19th century biologists, was the, which was the adaptation of organisms to their environment. A woolly sheep in a cold climate, well adapted. Well, Darwin says, I can explain that too with, <clears throat> by, by looking at what nature does. So he, he replaced artificial selection with natural selection and got rid of design. And um, you've written a book, Darwin's Doubt, so um, that's a very <coughs> interesting title considering that it seems right. as though he sorted the whole argument out and you're, um, you've written this book on his doubts. Well, many modern, pub, I call them Darwin's public defenders, uh, people like Richard Dawkins or in our country, Eugenie Scott, um, have, are prone to rhetorical excess. And uh, Professor Dawkins has been quoted as saying that if you doubt the theory of evolution, you're either stupid, wicked, or insane. So, and then he, he says he prefers not to think about the wicked bit. But, yeah. um, and in our country, Eugenie Scott had a very prominent hearing about what to teach about the theory of evolution, where a school board was considering the idea that we ought to teach the strengths and weaknesses of scientific theories to students, said um, there are no scientific weaknesses with evolutionary theory, and thus the theory ought to be exempted from that kind of a standard. Well, in contrast to that kind of rhetorical dogmatism, Darwin himself was actually very modest rhetorically. And he was aware that the argument that he was presenting, though it had many um, strengths, it also had some uh, difficulties. And one of them was the problem of the sudden appearance of the major groups of animal forms, the very first animals in the history of life, in a period that we now call the Cambrian, and the explosive origin of animal life is now called the Cambrian explosion. And Darwin was very aware of this event in the history of life and the, the sudden appearance of these uh, uh, fossil remains of these animals in, the, in this, the Cambrian strata. And he said that this was a, 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 a very legitimate objection to the views here entertained. And he described the, the problem and he said to, as to why these animals appear suddenly, in, the, in the, the, the fossil record, he said he could give no adequate explanation. And so that was his doubt. And what I do in the book is I tell the story of that doubt and how it has developed and grown into 
actually a full-blown crisis in evolutionary biology to the point that we're, uh, we have leading evolutionary theorists now calling for a new theory of evolution because they recognize that Darwin's mechanism of natural selection acting on random mutation or variations, and we would now refer to random mutations, does not have the creative power that Darwin attributed to it and that evolutionary biologists since Darwin have typically believed that it has. And uh, this term neo-Darwinism, right. can you sort of expand on that? Sure, it's the, uh, neo-Darwinism is the modern version of Darwin's theory. It, incorpor it incorporates insights from genetics that Darwin was unaware of in the 1850s and 60s. And in particular, it, inc it incorporates the idea that mutations are a form of random variation that are driving the evolutionary process, that are producing new form and structure in the history of life. So the Darwinian mechanism was natural selection acting on random genetic variations. Now biologists would talk about natural selection acting on random variations, but also a particular form of variation called uh, mutation, which we understand in terms of changes to the sequences of, of the um, genetic, um, the, the, the chemicals that form the genetic text. And um, proponents of ID, before we go into sure. um, what, what they see uh, about the origin of human life, on that specific instance of the Cambrian explosion, um, how do you read that? Well, maybe we could back up just a bit sure. to define ID, sure. because Darwin's theory is actually very helpful in, you asked a minute ago about the traction that ID yes. is getting, and, yeah. and, and that it is very hard for a new theory to get traction, but uh, intelligent design, I think, is getting traction for a couple of reasons. One, because we think there's very strong evidence for it, and we can talk about that in a minute, but secondly, because we are framing the argument around the central proposition of Darwinian theory. We're engaging the very question that he designed his theory to engage. All biologists recognize that living organisms give the appearance of design. Richard Dawkins, with whom I disagree, but whom I appreciate for the clarity he brings to the debate, has said that um, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. And there he's speaking as a good Darwinian. He's a good neo-Darwinian, but he's, he's, he is expressing the Darwinian view that started with Darwin himself, that the appearance of design is effectively an illusion because there is an undirected, unguided process that can produce that appearance without any guidance or direction behind it. And that process is natural selection acting on random variations and That's the and central mutations. argument, isn't That's it? That's the central it? argument. Yeah. It's the central uh, proposition of Darwinism. I think it's his central legacy. is his refutation of design and biology because natural selection, again, can do what the, the human breeder can do or any intelligence can do, and therefore we don't need an intelligent designer or, even, or, or creator to explain the, the appearance of design in life. An intelligent design is taking on that proposition. It's saying that the appearance of design is not an illusion. It's in many cases real, and it's the product of an actual designing intelligence. And so the, the design that we see is the result of real design, not apparent design. 